Good morning, everybody. I hope you can um, you can all hear me and see me okay. And welcome to Food Tech Matters and the first session, which is feeding the world with big data and AI. I'm David Flanders, I'm CEO of Agrometrics, and we are meant to have three presenters. We've got two so far. We're waiting one other, and a fourth, fourth one, um, Emmanuel Delerme from. Uh, CAF or had to pull out, unfortunately, at the last minute. But I'll provide a warm welcome to my current two fellow presenters, which is Conan Condon and Cyril Ashkenazi. And oh, the third one is just joining, which is excellent. So I'll just wait for Kirill to join. Kirill, good morning. We're, all, we're, we're live. Good morning. Good morning. I'm, good morning. Yeah, we can I'm hear you well. So <laughs> good morning. We're all live. So Emmanuel, unfortunately, couldn't make it. So there's the three of you and then me trying to be the referee in the middle here. Well, not quite sure in the middle of three, but anyway, you know what I mean. So um, we're on for an hour. The The format is going to be that I'll ask each of the presenters to for the session, just give a one or two minute introduction to their organizations. And then there are three main questions that which have already been set by the organizing committee and we'll go through those. And then that'll probably develop the further conversation in free form. And after that, for the last part of the hour we'll have we'll answer and discuss q a so there's a q, you should all see a q a button on your web screen so please type your answers in they won't be seen by everybody until they get published and we'll do that for the questions to answer so my apologies if some questions aren't answered but at the moment we're hoping to answer all questions that come in so perhaps i'll start with sorel sorel perhaps you'd like to give a minute or two in your, in your background and your organization yeah thank you very much david Hi, everybody, and good morning. It's um, a pleasure for me to attend this uh, panel in Food Tech Matters. Um, I'm the founder and CEO of a company called CDEX. CDEX is based in Israel. Um, we are part of a group of companies which has uh, many years of experience in computer vision and uh, uh, artificial intelligence technologies. Um, companies that are in a, a wide variety of, of uh, fields, starting from uh, objects uh, uh, within uh, digital images and then uh, a lot of technologies that related to facial recognition. And at CDEX, we uh, clearly brought the facial recognition technology into the seeds and grain industry with the uh, uh, goal to uh, find the correlation between the phenotype of a seed to the genotype of the plant that is going to grow uh, uh, afterward. And all of that for the uh, benefit of the seed companies, the uh, seed production within the seed companies, of course, the research, and uh, also for the uh, food industry, wherever the grains are uh, involved like all the field crops that is known to everybody, corn, soybeans, wheat, rice, uh, etc. What we are doing is um, training an algorithm about different genetical characteristics of seeds or grain only by looking at the uh, uh, seeds. And after training the algorithm, we can develop a classifier that at the end of the day will be uh, um, implemented into a sorting machine. So for the purposes of QA of seeds, for example, we will be able to sort out the seeds which are not qualified. For example, uh, uh, we can train the algorithm to detect over uh, a lot of seeds that just came from the seed production, which seeds are going to germinate and which seeds are not going to germinate. And by that, sort out the seeds which are not going to germinate and really change the uh, industry standard which is set today for 90 percent germination into 98 or 97 or 99 percent germination in every lot this is just a small example uh, um, in in the food industry we have some solution that are referred to the quality of the grains such as uh, to detect uh, existence of uh, microtoxin, microtoxins, or uh, uh, to try to classify between a GMO versus its null version over a lot of uh, 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 field crops. In general, uh, uh, we are working with seed companies and, and food uh, uh, industry 
we are at this stage now that we are developing the first sorting machine that would be mainly for vegetable seeds but future wise we are going to implement our system within the existing color sorters in the uh, 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 market both for the seed industry and for the uh, uh, food industry excellent so thank you very much for well, being here yeah. and thank you and from let's go from um seeds to animals let's go to conan yeah thanks david good morning everybody uh, my name is conan condon and i'm the director and cto for intouch so intouch is a technology where we have an iot connected device on tmr mixer wagons uh, where we guide the farmer on how to feed the animals uh, we also have tmr management software where we allow the farmers to put in their ingredients and then again, like Asara said, we've got algorithms that are running in the background that will uh, tell the farmer what way to load his machine and how long to mix for. Those, uh, that feed is then fed to the animals and the objective for us is to get consistency. So it's consistency in preparation, consistency in delivery means consistency in uh, production. Uh, we are uh, a long established uh, organization we've been working in the feeding technology from uh, say the IOT or big data space since about 2008 um, we've got over 2,000 customers using our technology in 41 countries uh, we predominantly brought um, came from within the Keenan um, uh, company which is the manufacturers of the TMR mixer wagons uh, I myself have been with the company uh, Keenan Alltech for 22 years. Uh, we were acquired by Alltech in 2016. So Alltech is a multinational company with uh, over 5,000 employees that is predominantly working in the feed industry, uh, where we make um, uh, feed additives. Uh, we've also are into the crop science. We've got a beverage division. Um, so again, my area is in the ruminant, but we go across the whole supply chain um, and across all the species from ruminant to, to pig to poultry uh, and into the uh, plants as well. Thank you, Carolyn. And so from plants to animals to um, vertical farming, etc. So Kirill, perhaps you'd like to give an introductory to in direction to iFarm. Yeah, exactly. Thank you very much. I'm Kirill Zelensky. I'm working as CEO of iFarm Europe. iFarm is a company doing technology exactly for, for growing food already. So when we, when we take seeds from cereal, and then and then we know that those seeds are growing. And then we, our technology allows you to, uh, let's say, to learn farm how to how to grow those seeds. So with, with, with our technology, farmers can grow uh, almost automatically so they just take seeds which which were tested by Sarel and also tested by us and we know how to grow them and then our system know how adjust environment in uh, in in farm and then uh, users just just need to push button saying okay i want rucola or strawberry or whatever seeds and then system automatically do the rest until harvesting moment and just just alarming users that it's already time to eat time to harvest it and eat so what 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 we are doing we exactly we know the seeds we know how they are growing and we know how how systems should adjust all environment inside farm so how to what what should be what should be temperature humidity whatever what even even supplying of fertilizers and do it everything automatically so what this is what we are trying to do and of course for doing that we are using a lot of sensors including cameras iot devices it's everything connected to internet and then our farm it's it's it just it's not farm anymore it's 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 kind of computer big computer which allows you to grow food automatically so this is what thank we're doing. You. thank you very much well, i'll just finish off i'm david flanders i'm the ceo of agrometrics and agrometrics was sort of born out a few years ago five years ago out of the uk government's agri-tech initiative which was to try and push through a lot of technology that's well science and that's developed in uk academia that's to try and get it further through etc into 
in more of the front line. And Agrimetrics is one of four centres set up by the government with initial government funding. We, we, we're a commercial organisation. We have to um, make our own way in the world. We still have some core public funding. Um, so we set up to create a data marketplace, a, a place to manage, find and monetize agri-food data. So we can right across the whole agri-food system through from the farm through to the ag-fintech. Ag and we set up a, a data marketplace based on data technology which uses semantic web and the, the four main aspects of what we do is it's, it's a place it's a data marketplace you can monetize your data you can make it available sell it through there you can also use it privately if you want to share with your collaborators use the data marketplace for that there's it's an ever-growing catalog of data and we do a lot of work around how as everybody knows, I think there's a lot of data in the sector, but it's not necessarily used as well as it can be. And we have people who, um, in professional services, data enablement, help people to get the most out of their data in their organization and using the data platform. And part of our endeavors, which particularly germane to today's meeting, is that we use AI technology, AI and machine learning. We've partnered, we're based on Microsoft Azure, we partner with Microsoft and we partner with Airbus. And with Airbus, we've been working and have algorithms developed to identified field boundaries worldwide. And on top of that, we use um, satellite data provided by Airbus to derive um, the crops growing earlier than we believe anybody else can. And they're likely harvest times we've, and we're working further towards um, being able to predict yield. And so we're based in the UK, but we, we cover the world. That's me. Right. Thank you. Thank you, speakers. Um, I'll read out the first of the three main questions we're going to build on and then expand out of. The first one is, what do the latest developments in AI and machine learning mean for farming and the food supply chain? So, Sorrel, do you want to just start with you? Is that okay? You were the first to go as well. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, um, I think that that the development or the latest development in AI, it will take a little bit of time, and that's related to, to probably other question, but uh, it's going to clearly change the, the farming, change the industry. And uh, um, when talking about farming, uh, at least for us, it's not only farming, it's also the continuous of the supply chain. What happened after farming, after harvesting uh, uh, with the food? Uh, I think that it starts with uh, uh, first AI for the research and breeding, no matter in which field, even if it's for animals or for seeds. Uh, um, AI is changing, it's accelerating the pace of breeding. It uh, uh, gives the researchers the ability to know and to uh, achieve a lot of more information that were not being achievable before. The analysis of the data really uh, uh, changed the way that breeders and researchers are working, which of course will help later on uh, uh, with the farming. And if uh, talking about the farming itself, so I think that by expressing what the companies are doing, both Conan and Kirill explain it very well, but I think that uh, at the end of the day, it comes to better resource utilization. Uh, uh, you have a lot of data involved. Um, it could be data about the environment, the uh, uh, soil, the uh, uh, climate, the, the humidity, uh, and the main change of the AI, it's the way of analyzing the data and the, the fact that it's a real-time data. And it's not something that could be processed after a week or after eight weeks of, of or, or I don't know uh, uh, how much time. It's a real-time data, so the farmer can react uh, uh, immediately. And at the you know, if you if you uh, uh, combine all this together, so so we we are going to end with uh, what everybody called precision agriculture, and of course uh, increasing yield, and of course bring us better product to to the market and to the industry. Thank you, Sir. That, that sets the ground nicely. Conan, could you want to follow on? Yeah, listen, a great analogy by Sarah. Um, of what AI can do, and it is about that big data set. It's about uh, getting that real-time information. 
and being able to action that real-time information. And probably the one of the key things that, again, uh, I suppose coming from looking at from myself from the ruminant side of thing is, uh, one of the big big things is is in that our sector is the labor shortage and how a AI can actually help uh, with the labor. Uh, like within Ireland, um, the leading kind of um, research body, Chagas, estimates that uh, within Ireland alone, there's there about 6,000 people shortage uh, working on farms. Uh, no one is coming up uh, within the farming sector to take over farms. So that means going to, it's going to reduce the amount of farms there. We know that farms are getting bigger, uh, that are growing there. But for me, real, really, AI is how can that tackle uh, the labor challenge? Um, because I think if we can, if we can get the technology and the data analyzed correctly and the big data sets talk and teach other correctly, because that's one of the biggest things. If you're mm -hmm. doing a big data set with AI and you're doing it on your own, that's fantastic. But it really doesn't hit the challenge of what the farm requires. Um, so you need to be able to join those uh, big data sets together. But I think it really has a really has an opportunity to hit that uh, that labor issue within the market. Excellent. Thank you. Some good points you made already. Kirill, would you like to add to those? Yeah, actually, almost nothing to add. But for us, I would say that uh, AI is, is a way to to save a time. So we are collecting a lot of data and then and then we are teaching our system how to react. And then of course, uh, of course we are still using agriculture uh, uh, institutes and engineers to understand all this kind of data. But when, when, when we can teach our system and it can react immediately, it's, it's really immediately, it's comparing to situation on, on, uh, on the fields, in vertical farming, we have totally controlled environment, and we can react in, in, in uh, you know, in one second to to things and, and and change something in environment inside when it's totally controlled. It's 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 very good, and for us, it's it's kind of possibility to give you predictable result as 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 farmer or as customer or so. It's it's no matter in in quality or in. Uh, quantity or in test in flavor whatever but we can we can make exactly what what we want to do it, it's it's like like a gut you know we can create whatever and then uh, and then uh, computers helps us to to understand what will happen in in next 10 minutes or in next 10 days no matter so it's Excellent. just totally changing the way my, my growing Absolutely. I think there's some really good points there. And I, th I suggest we maybe a short discussion about those, the points you've all made. And, and, and from now on, if, if questions asked by me or through, through the, um, the Q and A, I think put your hand up if you want to talk. Otherwise, <laughs> if nobody picks a hand up, I'll pick on somebody. Um, I think one thing that really came out of that is, is the real time. The fact that we're moving towards real time data. The second big thing I think, and a, actually a question I'd like to pose is, Certainly, I think from the UK and what I understand a global perspective, there's a lot, a lot of more and more data coming into the agri-food system, but it's still siloed. It's still not connected. I just wondered if AI is a way to sort of pull things together. If you think, if you think there's an opportunity for AI to be the sort of glue that pulls things together, I, if anybody would like to take that thought forward, anybody? Conan, after you yep. first, please. Yeah, I, uh, David, it, it's a really good question. Um, at the moment, I don't think AI is the place to be able to gel that data together because that data together needs to, you need subject matter experts that understand the data that can pull that data together. Uh, and again, knowing your company, David, like you got uh, your marketplace, that's, that's technology that can, you can plug in your data sets together and be able to share data. Because uh, one of the biggest challenges I think is for, is for the kind of the startup industry where they don't have the customers or the connection to be able to talk to the people who are who are acquiring the big data sets. Um, so that's like a data marketplace, like even like what Microsoft are using uh, on Farm Beats. It's with that thing is how can we plug into a marketplace to share that data uh, coming in? They're not using AI, um, but they are using their their technologies to be able to link that data through uh, your big data your big data lakes or your uh data factories 
Um, it's about merging that data. It's not easy. It's not straightforward. And I don't think uh, linking data sets is it's all it's going to require a human element uh, for mm -hmm. a while, but until there's kind of structures. And we've seen already in the agricultural industry where a lot of top players um, from in in the machine side of say of the um, the tractors, the Adcos, the John Deere's, and so on like that. They tried to put in a standard of communication. But the problem was, while it was a great idea and thought about putting a standard in there, technology is moving too fast. So if you mm. put a standard in, the technology is replacing it. And we can see that with the guys that you're doing vertical farming and, uh, and seed gen germination and stuff like that. Like that technology is moving quicker each time that you go on. So it's hard to get AI, AI machine learning to do it. Well, I think machine learning would probably have a bigger role playing it because of that bigger data set you can pull out what the anomalies are and try to work from that but probably later down the road it will have a play but i don't think it has it has something at the moment Carell or sorrel any you'd like to add to that i, I don't have any okay that, that was some really good points and i, I just have a sorry I, I have a question related to that which touches on something else you mentioned earlier Conan, which is i think it's a twofold aspect one i think you mentioned the sort of you know the ever diminishing supply of labor within and certainly within the uk pulling out the eu in terms of migrant labor for harvesting so but at the same time so i think part of the issue like you said but there's also at the other end of the spectrum there's a big skill set gap in terms of data scientists etc within the sector and so and the, the sort of third leg of the stool is the farmer who's at the sharp end of this, I think part of the problem is farmers can't be data scientists. And so I think there's a, there's a challenge at the one end with robotics, maybe we'll come on to later. There's a challenge in having the sort of data scientists to help the, t the people like us who are producing stuff. But I think maybe there's an even harder challenge in a way, which is making, if you are have got technology to use AI, et cetera, pull all these data together, it's making it available to the farmer in a usable form. And I wondered if anybody, from their own experience would like to put the hand up and have some comments on that. Sorrel or Kirill, would you like? Yeah, I'll give yeah. Sorrel first, Kirill, I'll come to you in a minute. Thank you. Yeah, uh, um, yeah it definitely, uh, I think that the skill set is definitely a big challenge, um, mainly because, and you know, it's something that is happening is with any uh, technology uh, transferable of, of any kind of market. First stage of technology is running too fast then people doesn't really know how to react to, to the technology fast. So I'll give an example that related to farming. Farming historically uh, it used to be, you know, a family ownership uh, uh, groups where the uh, uh, grandpa was a farmer, the son was a farmer and, and the grandson was a farmer. And, and you can see the shift coming up today which if you will ask a farmer today what he would like his kids to be, he will tell you that the scientist. If you will ask a farmer, if you will ask a farmer hundreds of years ago what he would like his kids to be, he will tell you what, what are you asking? He's going to replace myself in the farm. So, so, so this is the big shift that, that you can see coming up today. And I think that specifically for this call, machine learning could be the answer because sometimes the abilities of machine learning is to replace data scientists. Because once you succeed to train the system, or once you succeed to train the algorithm to know to make the right classification, uh, uh, it's part of replacing the data science. Of course, as Conan said before, you will need a lot of data and that's a key for machine learning. The more data you have, the better skills the machine learning will have but i think that the machine learning will be the the key to make the transformation of the uh, 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 traditional farming into technological farming or into ai farming because the machine learning itself will be able to replace some of the or the lack of data scientists existing mm. and then the son of the existing farmer could be the next data scientist yeah <laughs> And maybe run the farm too. Kirill, have you anything to add to Sorrel's excellent point? <laughs> I would say, I would say, Zavin will not be needed to be data scientist. 
So it's 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 like with personal computers, which which were from the beginning, which were only for programmers, for for coders who understand. Now every one of us can use it, even not knowing what is inside. Same story. I hope it will be with with farming. So nobody will will know what what happens inside and why it's growing, but it will just magically grow. No, I like, like the idea of the magic. I think a, a point to make might be: we, I hope it takes place quicker than the transition from <laughs> from computers being from computer scientists to the iPhone. But, Karen, I think perhaps of, of all the people here, you're probably at the, the sharp end of this in terms of the work that some that all take and in and touch do. So, what's your experience about? Because obviously, you have to make sort of complex. You're doing complex computational AI work behind, mm -hmm. and then you have a. I've seen your machines. There's a nice display board. So how how much how much time and effort and how much you have to evolve and change in terms of feedback and how much of a problem is that to go from you know put, having a piece of paper saying this is what you should put in and to this is your latest feed mix for today's for today's run. Yeah, and and that, and that's the thing because that's a transition. That's like where you where you've got traditional farmers again we know the typical age of a of a farmer within the ireland and uk uh is 56 57 years of age and and that's it and it's not getting any smaller um so again taking taking your feed sheet from the back of a fag box or the back of a cardboard box to actually digitizing it on the machine was a challenge um and it was a challenge for some farmers that they didn't didn't take on it but what we had to do we had to make it simple so as Kira said like what a computer you don't need to know what's inside the computer but what you got to do is follow what the computer's telling you uh so again we had to make it simple that you put in you, t you select what how many animals you're feeding you select how many rations you want to feed those animals in case they fed out they ate everything the previous day and you want to give them a bit more so simply the way to do it and consistency going through. And the big thing is from farmers, from what we found in the feedback and looking at the trends of what they see and what they go on and look at information, it's all down to finance. It's all down to economics. How much is it costing me? Where can I save money? Uh, and so on. And that consistency. So once we show them feeding consistently, we can see your yield is improving. We can see your dry matters intake your costs are going down, so your income over margin um, feed is actually going up, then they buy into the system. So what we tend to do is we've got two different types of uh, programs. Say, for example, the UK. In the UK, when we sell a new machine and a new technology on top of it, we give them the technology for 90 days. So we give them that try to buy uh, things. So once we get them over that uh, technology step, and it takes a bit of time, so we, we, we spend a lot of time on onboarding. Uh, so we do about seven contacts within the first 90 days, uh, twice on farm and five over the phone. So our system also has skilled nutritionists that look at that information and proactively call the, call the farmer. So that's really important. It's really important with that technology when you're going out to mass, when you're going out to a mass audience that every farm is different, every farm is different set up. So it's, it's a real challenge, David, is that technology barrier it's getting over that technology but it's how easy and how simple you get them to use it and that's how easy it is to use the technology but also how you transfer that information that, that, that's interesting because it's 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 interesting that you say you refer to the average age of the farmer and the fact that you ha you still have to have the sort of five phone calls i mean you know, it's, it's, compare that with your iPhone app. I've I've never had to phone somebody up to work out how to use an iPhone app, and so it's interesting that. Do you think as the hopefully the younger generation of farmers comes in that they'll need less of the understandable handholding? Do you think that was? Ch yeah, do you see a sort of a change as time goes by? I see it changing already. Like it's it, everything that we've got to do now. The next generation device that I'm building, and the next information uh, gen generation of information systems I'm building. Everything has to be in that cabinet attractor, right? Everything has to be. Previously, where we were outside on the physical mixer wagon, yeah. everything is moving inside to the cab. So That's I've got to, get, I've to get all my technology into the cab. That's interesting. So because I think use that technology. So again, and then just for everybody in the audience, please, if you get, there's some interesting um, comments and issues being raised, please feel free to put questions into the Q&A. And for Kirill and Sorrell, I think we'll start with Kirill. I think one of the things that Conan touched on was the sort of 
proving or showing to the farmer the capital, the significant capital investment will have that return on return. And I think I may be wrong and I apologize, but Krill, I imagine for you, for vertical farming, that's the biggest, you're probably in the, in, in the Sorrell's probably fairly that level, but you, it's, how do you find, because vertical farming is an expensive capital investment, how do you find the sort of your customers and potential customers how difficult is it to persuade them that this is a relative new technology you've got to have faith and it will reap its rewards how how much of a barrier is that actually you know it's it's interesting question uh you know most of our most of our customers who are using our technology for uh, building vertical farms and start to use it they never been farmers before so most of most of our customers they are kind of That's new farmers they yeah. decided they decided to start new business and decided to start uh, food either they are selling food like in restaurants or supermarkets or they just you know people who decided that okay maybe we'll start to produce food and sell food so none of them are, are farmers in past so it's kind of a new it's they're not changing the way of farming but it's it's kind of new farmers city farmers or, or or others this is number one number two what am i trying to do am i trying to prove the concept and, uh, and for example my building farms here in europe and in russia my building own farms first of all we need them to make experiments with uh, with crops with seeds so we may, may have to we have to have some base for our artificial intelligence system to provide more data and to test different seeds that's why we already know how to grow about 120 crops and and we're still adding them all, all the time because we're doing experiments myself but from other side we're doing it also to to prove the concept that it will be profitable even with this kind of capital investment you still um, may do it profitable while selling selling food out of out of farm, and and those we know we know all investments we know how much money you will spend per per, per farm, and we know all opex of course we know how it works and my my learning how to sell and we can provide to our customers even even kind of business model for farms. So, which, which, which actually really, really helps because when people come to us and say, okay, we, we would love to build a farm, but we don't know uh, how much it costs. We don't know what will be the revenue, what results will it be profitable or not, but we have already answer for them. For, for many countries, we already have, for example, for Europe, we know uh, all, all equipment, uh, all uh, electricity, all costs we, we know in general so sometimes it's it's vary from country from country to country but generally we know uh what will be the business model for for different kind of farmers for for supermarkets for restaurants for for food processing companies for for just private farmers who will build it and and start to sell in food so it's it's it makes our life it's a little bit easier but still it's big investment yes it's it, it's still but but i would say that that normal farms and normal traditional greenhouses it's, it's cost cost about the same and then, and then productivity in vertical farm and totally controlled environment is much, much higher than in a normal greenhouse. So it's it's step by step. We are doing it, and, and not not only we. So we have competitors. So it's it's anyway it's promoting the system. That's interesting. It's interesting that people from outside the sector are happy to grasp the capex cost and see the return investment. Yet it's the same equation and yet farm it, the people in the farming sector aren't. I think that's interesting both ways. Sorel, but perhaps you'd like to describe your sort of capex. Yeah, yeah. Experience. I think, I think, I think that, that what Kirill said, I think that it's the key because Kirill just explained the path that they have to go in order to make it, to make it available for the farmers. And I think that this is the key uh, among our, us as uh, founders of technologies to find the right way in order to penetrate into the market, in order to achieve the goals that we need to get it into the farmers, to find the right way how you can make the technology affordable. And even if it will be step by step. So, so from our experience at CDEX, what we did is we had to, to take additional 
one or almost two years of development in order to build our algorithm in a way that it would be able to implement an existing sorting machines. So, so, so the uh, change of capex for the customer is very minimal, and we are bringing in a, a new, you know, finance structure for this industry and. We are not going to change your capex, but we are going to charge as a service as a software model, and this is the the kind of change that uh, uh, the farming industry is starting to get used to make it. For us, it's mostly the seed companies, but I think that when the customer sees the main benefits, if it's as I said before for seeds, to know which one is going to germinate or which one not or for the grain industry, for example, and that's more, more uh, related to the, feed, to the food sector, we can look at the seed from outside, whether it's a corn or soybeans, and tell a lot about the nutrition facts. Level of protein inside, level of oil inside, only by looking at the outside. And there are many sorting machines, vision sorting machines existing today, that their goal is mostly to clean the batch they are sorting by color and shape. So we are implementing our technology within these sorting machines. Uh, uh, we are implementing our brain and adding a lot of value for the farmer, for example, instead of sorting only by color and shape, sort also by level of protein or sort also by level of, of uh, oil content and it's known in the industry that, for example, even if you grow as a farmer a 40% protein soybeans, because of environmental effects within the field, you're going to have somewhere between 35% to 45%. The average will be 40. But if you can separate the 45, you can sell them for a premium price and separate the, the 45, the 40, and the 35. And that's how we are uh, bringing it to the market. And, and I believe this is the key, to find the right way to less capex and uh, uh, making on, on their working capital instead of uh, uh, capital equipment. That's interesting. So between the three of you, you're at sort of the OPEX end and Carrillo's at the CAPEX end, and I think Cone and some in the middle. And I think so, something you touched on there is sort of payment by result. You're not, not quite there, but certainly I get the feeling in the industry that particularly the big players, the ag chem, moving more towards the farmer pays for what, you know, basically the amount of product at the end of it. And that will require a lot of um, monitoring, et cetera, to make sure the farmer's doing what they're meant to be doing. And so there's a role for AI. Have any of you, like, put your hand up, have any thoughts about moving towards not necessarily your business, but in general, the sector, whether AI is driving to more, more to, will help drive towards more payment by result rather than payment for inverted commas service. Has anybody got any thoughts on that? Put a hand up. No. Okay. Well, if people have got questions, oh, Sorel, thank you. I'll let you go. We, we are, we are, as I said, we are transferring it to service as a software model, but we are charging by result. Right. We are charging only by sorted seeds or sorted grains and not the old batch, just to mention that. Sam. Okay, well, good. Okay, um, so please, people who are busy watching early in the morning, please do put some questions in. I'll move to the next question we had set for the panel, which is, we've touched on some of this already, but it'd be interesting to hear your opinions. And I'll start with you, Karel, in reverse order. What are the challenges of implementing data-driven farming? What are the challenges of implementing data-driven farming? We've touched on some, but maybe some others you'd like to bring up. Kirel, are you, I think, can you hear me okay? You seem to be muted. Yeah, oh, you're back yeah. Actually, actually, I think the challenges are, are, are the same. It's, it's just cost of equipment. So it's it's already, when you have technology, it's already okay. It's, it's, it's no matter, you can implement it. But uh, it's, it's, it's like any, any farm. You just have to build it physically. So you have to buy all equipment, you have to combine all together, but no any other challenges than, than, than people who, who is ready to invest. 
I have a thought. It's interesting, but maybe a thought for whether Conan and Sorrell want to comment on this is: Do you think government policy has is can help influence the sort of uh, implementation of data-driven farming? Do you think there's a room for government policy to help with this or hinder any from Israel or maybe Ireland and stroke EU? Any perspectives on that? Yeah, David. I think I think it's got a big it's got a big role to play in it. Um, if you look at any type of farming. Any grant-based farming tends to get technology adopted, whether it's physical hardware or it's technology. Uh, farmers just want grants. <laughs> like they want, if, so, if, if a government can give them 40 to 60% of a grant uh, for a technology or for a piece of hardware, they will go and buy it. Okay, so that's that gets away your, get, that gets over your cost barrier of entry. You right. still have to adopt your technology onto the farm. And whether that might be the right uh, technology for them, but definitely, definitely supports. You just see farmers go out and buying stuff, and you ask them, "Why did you buy it?" Well, I got a grant. There was a grant available. <laughs> so it's it's very much in that mindset. Um, and one of the biggest challenges that I have with the kind of from the government in that area, it's very much that your technology has to be available for everybody. Our technology that we're building, that Sarah, that Kira has, that technology is not for everybody. And they don't see that as mass. They'll only right. see the mass as where if you've got a dairy cow, you need a milking parlor. I'm going to give you a grant for a milking parlor. I'm also going to give you a grant for uh, feeding in the parlor. But if you're feeding the parlor, then you're not getting an actual correct TMR ration into the cow. You're actually yes. giving sugar and sugar and sugar. And that cow is not going to get longevity. So the, with the, the path that they're moving towards, I will be suspect on it. Because, and that's mainly because I'm biased, because they're not giving me a grant for my technology. But that's <laughs> so, so, Sorrel, before I come to you, Kirill, you had your hand up a second ago. So you had a point to make in relation to what Conan was saying. Yeah, actually, actually, about government, yes, it's an interesting question because, because uh, especially in our case, when when we when we build vertical farms with totally controlled environment, uh, in Finland and in Europe, when when you start to use this kind of farm, you are not farmer anymore. So you are producing you are producing food, but you are not farmer. So you you cannot get any kind of discounted loans from government. You cannot get any. Uh, subsidize from from government so because you are not farmer anymore this is a problem because because it's considered as, as kind of technology for food but it is not farmership anymore this That's is yes this, this a, equation is still open so it, it does sound like there needs to be an education process for um for, for government and the people that size things so what's your experience in israel yeah um so, so I, I will connected to, to something that uh, I think it's it's much wider scope uh, uh, about the, the grant from government or, or it's not only grant I think that the, the government has <coughs> to to put a lot of more efforts uh, in in digi timing the farming because the the, uh, uh, the lack of food in 2050 it's a global challenge is the same as air pollution it's the same as the uh, uh, the, the climate change, and and you see a lot of G7 summits or something that are related to the climate change, and uh, uh, way too low numbers of such summits handled by the the G7 or the G8 handled for the future of the food, and I think that it has to start over there, and once it will start over there they will immediately understand that technology is going to change it and technology is giving the best way to achieve the level of food that we're going to need in 2050. So th that's my two cents about the, the uh, 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 government. <coughs> about the challenges <coughs> of implementing, I think that for the farming area, uh, besides the, the fact that the farming is kind of traditional, uh, 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 industry and it's quite different to, to uh, uh, adopt technological changes. I think that we see the change here, but I think that one of the main challenges is is uh, uh, how to collect the data. The data. I'll give an example for for Google to know a lot about myself. 
they need only the cell phone, which uh, track my, my location, knows where do I uh, surf in the internet, which app I use and what I text, whatever. Here in the farming, you have too many variables. What is the soil, the climate, the air, the condition of the cow, if the cow is healthy or not, uh, uh, viruses, many different ways that you have to collect data from many different ways. And I think that this one is a big challenge. And, and you can see that there are a lot of startup companies which are specializing. One is specializing only of measurement of the soil. One is specializing only measurement of X and the other on Y. So, so that would be the solution, but I think it's a big challenge. A farmer will have probably to adapt three to four to five different technology in order to achieve the holy grail and the real goal. And it's not that one company will be able to sell it uh, everything unless everybody will go with Kirill. No, I think that's a good, and I think just a quick bit about agrometrics, that's one of our challenges. We try and pull those data together, but it's, it, it is an issue in the fact that in a way, because there's so much technology about there, everything's becoming even more fractionated and divided rather than pulling together. And I've been to I've been into a farm office and see three different computer systems for the farmer because it's got three different operating systems for the farm, various aspects which don't talk to each other, which is it's, it's not positive. There's a question coming, and my apologies for question asks. Can you please your name comes up automatically? But can you also put the name of your company? And my apologies, didn't ask that at the start. So this isn't Barry Thorpe. He asks. Is the level of education skill base of the main labor on farms and it's just disappeared? That's interesting. It's going to, oh, well, it's, going to the it's going to publish. It's going to publish. Okay, thank you. Oh, yes. Is the level of education skill base of the main labor on farms combined with a philosophy of minimizing input costs driven by poor margins the greatest problems, the implementation of technology? So in other words, basically, is the, you know, Relatively low skill base uh, for technology. The basically the traditional you minimise your input costs, and there's low margins. Therefore, why should I bother with technologies? Anybody want to put the hand up a quick? We've covered some of that, but it, maybe it's an additional. Kirill, do you want to go first? I would say I would say minimising cost. Of course, it's it's uh, it's it's big problem. It's it's always because when you when you want to implement something, cost is always crucial. So if, if you cannot offer something by by affordable price, then it's difficult to offer, even if it's great technology. So this is, yes, but uh, low level of education is, you know, it's it just help us because my work in exactly for people with low level education. So it's 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 exactly helps to to promote technology because when when your technology working for for uh, not educated people, then it's good technology because then you don't need to educate and it's, it's, it's just help us. Conan or Sorel, anything to add to that? Yeah, again, it's a good question. Like it's, it's, it's about that um, low input cost. You can see places like we look at over California. California is a big, large dairy um, state. Uh, large farms uh, predominantly getting workers up from Mexico to come on and cheap labor on the farm. Um, but there's definitely a shift in there in that, in that state of technology. You've got vision analytic tools that are going into the barn to look at what the, uh, the feed bunker usage is. Uh, you've got AD and anaerobic digesters on farms to reduce the water and stuff like that. So I think technology is coming along. It will, in certain areas, have um, to go a bit further than the input costs. But again, that goes back to what uh, I think Sarah and Kira was saying. It's about there is a cost for the investment in the hardware or the technology. Uh, and it's how we can bring down those costs by improving the production uh, uh, increases. And that's only by showing results. Uh, and that's the key thing. Once your technology is proven to show do an X, Y, and Z, you will get an X return. That's the only way that the farmers will adopt it. Thank you, Mr. Sorrell. Anything to add? Uh, yeah, I think I think that that uh, uh, in referring to this question, the AI is is the uh, technology that is going to change it. And uh, uh, a, a small example could be that, that if you look twenty years uh, back, 
there were sensors in the soil, the, in the ground to measure the soil. There were sensors that could change the humidity and the temperature and the climate outside. There were sensors that could do a lot of things, but there was no any technology that merged everything. So the uh, 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 low level labor could come and read what the sensors are saying. And then he had to go to his manager to ask, look, the humidity is that, the soil is that, that, what should I do? And the manager will have to tell him. Now the AI system will tell him immediately what to do instead of, and I think that this is really the solution that is coming to, to solve this uh, issue. Thank you. Um, questions, any more questions, please put them in the panel and I'll move on actually, this is good. And I think that relates to just something we touched on earlier, which is that subsidy and government policy, et cetera, will drive towards that. And I think for negative reasons in the UK, originally negative reasons, one would argue, but I think the, e, the UK pulling out of the EU is actually pushing, for example, robotics. So I think there's a lot of government money being pushed into as a recent ag initiative where a lot of the funding went into robotics and for the simple reason that there's less labor available and so that pushes the technology so i think it's often those events like that which actually lead to the change in policy which can push that i know that the, the uk and i think some of the scandinavian companies countries as well are, are in norway are pretty hot on robotics you know for picking strawberries etc and if it starts in horticultural then move out into the into the wider area. The, the final question we had set for us, we've got, I think, got about nine minutes left, was what are the latest solutions being developed to take control of data collection and management and data security? So would anybody like to start on that? Maybe I'll I'll give a bit of a talk about this and we'll yeah. give a talk. Oh, oh, sorry, after you, go on. I'll let well, you so, go first. Uh, uh, I think that, that we all have evidence to, to many uh, uh, new technologies to, to collect data. So, so as I mentioned before, sensors were existing, but the sensors get more and more advanced right now. Uh, uh, but beside the sensor, I think that a lot is done, uh, um, at least for, for the uh, um, agri, uh, uh, even, even I think that for farming uh, of, of animals, uh, Drones, for example, it's something new, and we see it coming more and more and more. Uh, uh, all the usage of imaging systems. Look at the phenotype from top view, and you can tell a lot. Give a picture to agronomist, and this agronomist can tell you a lot about what's going on on the field and how to react immediately. I think that those technologies are, are uh, uh, leading in the way of imaging and phenotyping. But I think that the big step that was done in the last 10 years, it's uh, uh, more around gene predictions and uh, uh, genome analysis. And using AI technologies for genome analysis improved a lot the way of researchers to move forward today. And there are many companies that are that, uh, uh, dealing with it, but I think that this is main thing that will be able to, to help a lot. Uh, uh, together with the trend of reducing the amount of GMO, of genetic modifying, gene analysis will help to achieve uh, uh, similar results without genetically modifying. And I think that this is something that really dr drives the, the industry. That's interesting. So it's sort of the it's the interface of in inverted commas biology and AI in a way that is yeah, you know, yeah. It's, it's, it's technology is pulling together. Conan or Kirill, anything yeah. to add to that? Yeah, I suppose. Conan, do you want to go first? Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks, David. I suppose the key thing for me is about to look at the landscape. Um, whilst ag companies that are established for a while are looking at return investment, looking at what the ag tech can do in business models, I think we got to look at the startups. To me, the startups are the key to what is bringing on the new technology. They're the ones that got more freedom to go off and explore and do these big AI and machine learning uh, systems uh, while get funding. And probably the big thing, like I know that our industry, like in we're, we're growing forty percent year on year on investment on investment into startups. Um, like last year, there was three point six billion invested into ag tech startups. 
uh, while a third of that was taken up by the top five companies. And I, I don't know what you call uh, Impossible Foods or Farm Business Network startups, but that's what they're still uh, uh, classified as. But if you look at what you call it for someone like, say, uh, WeWork, they got 22.6 billion investment. And in the whole of iTech was 3.6 billion. Yeah. So while we're talking about feeding the world and big data and AI, we're so far off uh, of the level of investment uh, for the startups to actually achieve what we want to achieve uh, in AI and that. And that's one thing within all tech is we know ourselves internally, it's going to be very hard for us to do it. So what we've done is we create a program called the Pierce Lines Cultivator. So this is where we, where we bring um, late stage startups into our business to look at gaps within our industry and work with them on collaboration partnerships to bring a solution to farm. All tech has got the customers, startups don't have it, but they have the technology. And that's where I see integrating uh, big businesses with startups who got the, the technology ideas and the, the know-how of um, the data science that we say, or the AI or the Microsoft Azure or AWS, whatever it is, bring it together and bring solutions to the farmers, uh, customers. So that's where I see a big thing happening. That's interesting. I think in terms of other sectors and, um, for example, the pharmaceutical sector, where what tends to happen is if a, a startup's got a technology, the pharmaceutical company just buys it. I think that's a really interesting model to actually integrate growing startups help by partnering in a way. And that, that, I think that's 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 a nice model of the sector. Kirill and Sorel, have you got any experience of that? I'll start with Sorel, then I'll go to Kirill. Yeah, you, what's I your think, experience I think that, of... Yeah, I think that what Conan mentioned is 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 uh, uh, also related to to the challenges, and and you make a comparison about the investment, and that's related to the challenges which also the investors, even if it's a government, they are looking for a quick ROI, and this is one of the challenges of the uh, uh, agriculture industry. You don't have quick ROIs. You 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 have in order to know if a new technology will make the cow produce more milk, you need the cow to grow. And it will take a few years mm. until it will deliver milk. And, and same, same as if you want to check if, if a new tomato is, is coming up, it's time. And, and investors don't like it. And I think that this is a big challenge. And that's what makes the difference in, if you compare in Israel, for example, investments in cybersecurity technologies relatively to investment in in uh, ag tech startups we do <coughs> sorry we do have a lot of ag tech startups and we do have investments it's not that i can put it aside but there is a big gap between yeah, them and i think it's related i think it's related to the nature of farming which long processes and uh, a long roi for the investors Brilliant. Thank you. We've got about one more minute to talk. So before I thank everybody, Kirill, could you have got one more minute just to wrap up for you, from your perspective? You mean, uh, okay, if, if about security or? <laughs> uh, well, anything you'd like, if you, sorry, I've, I've caught you on the hop there. I apologize. I think what we'll do is we've got, we've got two okay. minutes. So I'll just, oh, I um, think, yeah, after you. I think it, it, it just developing now on, on, the, on the start of the path. And uh, I, I really hope that that uh, intelligent farming will be will be growing and growing as it's growing now, and uh, especially you know city farming, and we all will be still living in the future, whereas whereas we can we can have farm in every house and everywhere. So it's it's no matter. It it should it should be changed. Uh, you know today's way when when uh, food is growing only by people who who have some special knowledges it will change to the way when everyone can grow food for himself well thank you i think i better wrap up just thank you barry thorpe thank you barry for your question with some prognostics and sorel conan kirill thank you very much so i think it was a great start hopefully this the Food Tech Matters will carry on in the vein that you've got it going with a, gr a great and useful conversation. And thank you all for the early start. And I think we all come to an end. I think it probably automatically ends in a minute, but um, 
I'll wish everybody a good a good meeting and a good week. Thank so, you. Thank you very thanks, much. Thanks everybody, thank and thanks everybody much. for everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.